All right, so I think we're about ready to get started here. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, lead architect Yanesh Pandeya from McKesson here today, joining us all the way from the Bay Area, long flight out, but uh, it's a pleasure to get him uh, here and have the opportunity to tell the story uh, of McKesson and, and, uh, and how uh, they're leveraging uh, cloud native architecture, um, uh, open AI and et cetera to, to modernize their supply chain and get visibility into all the thousands of decisions they make per day. Um, but uh, but really excited to have Gyanesh here today. Uh, we've been working with him a lot recently and, and, uh, and yeah, absolute pleasure. So Gyanesh, let's go. Damn, this is okay. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Sounds good? Okay, perfect. My name is Ganesh Pandya, and um, I am a student of Java, Spring Boot, JavaScript, and lately NoSQL, especially specifically MongoDB, and uh, recently joined the class of AI as well. Uh, I work with a team who kind of help users achieve their business needs and also generate some values, right? Now, the value is, is, a, is a term that everybody has their own meaning to it, right? And I'll, I'll be talking through those various definitions of value throughout this uh, talk. The other part that I probably will touch upon is that uh, the digital transformation and AI. There's a lot of conversation happening around digital transformation and everybody is planning to or leverage some kind of AI in the software solutions, right? I'll talk through the journey that we have been having and how our choices have made organically going into the next gen cycle. But before we start, let's understand who we are. And here is McKesson. So McKesson is a medical distribution, drug distribution company, and we are information technology company as well. We do a distribution of uh, branded drugs, generic drugs, from, and other pharmaceuticals. We also provide various different products and solutions to our oncology-based, uh, you know, community-based oncology networks. We are right now on a fortune number nine, and our revenue is close to $308 billion as reported, by, or reported as on 2024. There are other segments that we operate on, such as, uh, you know, the Medicare, the affordability, you know, things, and we are international too. So we, in Canada, we support the supply chain and through retail pharmacies and wellness brands. Where do I fit in in this all of this ecosystem, right? So if you notice, there is a drug distribution, and in the part of drug distribution, there's a business unit called Generix. So this is, I'm the part of Generix distribution. Let's understand the Generix business now. So Generix is a word, the moment we hear it, it generates one term called cost effect in our mind, right? For example, when you go to pharmacy, or any retail pharmacy for that matter, and if you want to pick a, buy a drug, or when I say drug in the sense, medical drug, and uh, if you look for a Tylenol, for example, then you see a branded bottle and you see a Generix bottle. And the cost of the Generix bottle is way cheaper than the branded drugs, right? And there is reason to it. The reason being, there are multiple manufacturers who manufacture the drug, and that kind of drives this cost competition, right? You might see the similar pattern happening into electrical car market as well, right? Before we had just one company, now we have a bunch of company coming in, so it's kind of generating the cost effectiveness, which is helping consumers, right? Some data points to highlight here. In 2022, the total number of prescription in US was 6.7 billion prescriptions. It's not just a line, it's a prescription. And out of 6.7 billion, 91% was the generic share. One important, another point to highlight is in 1994, we had 36% of a generic share. So that, you now you can imagine from 36% to 91% from 1994 to 2022, so 28 years. And now you can see the graph as well. I mean, it's going upwards, right? Continuously it's going upwards. So what it tells us is basically the market conditions are changing, and new, new suppliers are coming in, new, new requirements from customers coming in, and McKesson has a flagship program. Give me one minute, I'm a little bit thirsty. Can you give me some water? So McKesson has a flagship program called One Stop, and the definition of this Genix program is to allow customers to have the best uh, cost, of, uh, cost of drug, right? So what it means is that needs are changing. So if needs are changing, that means the software systems that support that needs has to be agile, right? So let's move on. So now here is the thing. So we had a legacy system, legacy application, and our legacy application was not able to handle to 
the changes that were happening in the market. So what we did is we, we looked at the, our, the horizon and then uh, we applied some principles to it. So one of the core principles is, I mean, you might have heard in the keynote as well about the data modeling and then you know, behavioral driven design, right? So basically we try to understand the behavior of the customer, right? So we looked at that specific dimension and we applied that specific dimension to all of the different, different, uh, you know, the software development methodology, for example. So I need some water. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what we did is actually so, uh, we used the behavioral driven design. And there is another important aspect to understand is that change is hard in general. So when we try to implement some change, it has to be done into the iterative fashion. And this is where we looked at the current scheme of things and we thought, okay, it's important for us to have a cultural change first before we start adopting anything new, right? So, and we also noticed this, when we are doing so the change, first of all, the cultural change and the data classification, all of this, if you see the common denominator is the value generation and the behavioral driven design. And this is important because if you look at the agile, for example, when we look at uh, any story or any acceptance criteria, it's also behavioral driven. Now, if you look at understand the data modeling of MongoDB, it's also driven by the behavioral driven because you understand the read patterns and you identify it. Similarly, if you understand, or if you look at the cloud native uh, architecture or solid principle, it also talks about the behavioral driven because you create one specific artifact and it kind of handles one specific responsibility. It's also behavioral driven, right? And test suites, for example. So when you write a test suite, that's also behavioral driven. It's a common denominator cutting across multiple different dimensions, right? So we thought of, okay, let's leverage that because that gives us a common ground across all different segments, right? All those separate stuff. So now, this, this, is, this is super important, the cultural shift. How did we bring the cultural shift? So if I, let's say business user comes to us and if they ask for us some, some requirement, and if you say, you know what, we want to embrace agile, they will tell us, they, they probably would react. I'm asking you something, you're in turn asking me to learn something new. So what we did is we pivoted our conversation. We pivoted in a way that, do you wish to see the demos every two weeks without even taking the name of agile? We also spoke to them about saying that, do you wish to be part of all the critical decisions or can you explain your behavior side of it? So without even telling them that we are trying to adopt some new methodology, we were trying to give them some kind of a quick win so that they onboard our idea, right? So this is nothing but the cycle of the plan, do, check, and address. The do part is development. We'll come to that in a minute. But the idea here is that before telling users that, hey, we are trying to adopt safe principles or we are trying to adopt some agile principle, we spoke about the frequency of demos and their participation. So they kind of onboarded the idea. Sorry. Next part is, so you, you, next is do part. So same dimension again, wherein uh, we uh, applied the same design principles of uh, behavioral driven. So what we did is we started having conversation with users to understand their behaviors, their, their read patterns. And when we started about talking about the read patterns, that kind of automatically generated the idea of domains, specific domains. And remember in the morning we were talking about, uh, in another session we were talking about, it's called entity. It's nothing but those, these are aggregates. So you specify, you start identifying different, different entities. The moment you have identified these entities, that means you have a domain identified. And there's a concept called ubiquitous language. It's under domain driven design. So we use that principle to create these domains. So once we have these domains identified, what we did is we wrapped those domains into the specific services. Now this is a very scaled down version of the diagram just for the simplicity. But idea here is when we created services, so now if you think of any microservice, it also offers the HTTP endpoints. They are again behaviors. Get, put, post, patch, delete, whatever you say, they're all behavior driven. So we prepared those and then we expose those. Now the important part, another one here is on the right hand side where it says relation migrator. The other the important point here to understand is we had a legacy application. Now we have to migrate the data over to the new application. There were various tools available, but since we were planning to use MongoDB, so what we did is we started looking at relational migrator and it's a frictionless simply because 
We can do, use the JavaScript there. It also follows the document-based approach. And so there's no new learning from the developer point of view. So go to market, I mean, preparing this application was faster and faster you know, because the tech stack, the language, they were all common to whatever was used on the left-hand side was literally used on the right-hand side as well. So that's how we leverage this. The next one. So when we uh, developed this and gave it to the users, the new requirements started coming up. And this is where the Gen UI, UI use cases started coming. So one important point here to highlight is, sorry. There's a concept called finite game versus infinite game. Have you guys heard of that term called finite game versus infinite games? Okay, this uh, term was coined, I think James Carsey in 1980s. He came up with this concept called infinite games. So I'll take a minute to explain this. So when you go to basketball games or volleyball games, right? There's a fixed rule, there are fixed rules. There's a, they're fixed, your competition is fixed. The time is over, somebody wins, when somebody loses then you go home, right? In case of infinity game, infinite game, the rules are not fixed, the competition season is not fixed, so you need to keep playing. And you need to always be a better version of yourself. The software development is also a very similar kind of a notion. That it, it, there is nothing called winning in this case, right? You had a legacy application, you applied some principles, you built a new application, another technology set coming in, another requirement coming in, you need to make a better version of your, your own application, correct? So that's kind of uh, approach here we took, that it's infinite game, there's nothing called winning or losing here. So we, when, when we started looking at the different, different uh, the read patterns, then we realized that our landscape that we have, it can scale itself, and MongoDB had come up with the vector search, and that's where it started plugging in the Gen AI use cases. And remember I was talking about the value in the pre, uh, first, uh, first slide, or when I was giving the introduction, this is where it kind of unlocked some values, like time to market value. This is a new, uh, you know, the architecture diagram of the next gen. So here, the way we are implementing is, we did not vectorize our whole data set. What we did is, we've created embeddings for our metadata. So what it means is, if you see on the bottom section, where there is where it says admin. So what we did is, we identified our data store that we wanted to vectorize, we created their, their metadata, meaning their definitions, and, the, and, and MQLs for those uh, collections. We created the vector embedding and we had it prepared. Now let's say when user comes in, when user searches for something, what we did is we created the embedding for that user query, went to, did the vector search, this is called semantic search, found out the example MQL and the specific collection that needs to be utilized to, in order to satisfy the user query, then it went to the LLM, LLM expected out the target MQL, we took that MQL, executed against the data store that application was using. So we did, did not vectorize our application data, we actually vectorized the metadata and the example MQL. And user query was uh, satisfied. This is it. So we have been embarking on this journey. If you want to join Team McKesson, here is the QR code, or you can go to the careers.mckesson.com to join Team McKesson. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any questions? Thank you, Ganesh. By the way, this is my first time speaking in such a high ceiling room, <laughs> so it kind of made me thirsty. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? So the important point here is for, to, uh, the key takeaway is when we get any new requirement or any new uh, you know, the, the features to be developed or any new conversation that needs to happen. The super important thing is to understand the behavior. See, technolo technologically, we can solve anything, everything, right? But is it really generating the value? Is it really uh, gelling well with the philosophical point of when we are plugging, you know, different, different components? Because software development is a Lego. It's not really, um, it's not really a one thing you take and you try to put an adapter to it and you put another thing. That doesn't work. It may work for some time, but you don't want to put adapters all the time. So what you need to do is that it has to fit in properly. So the, re the only way to fit in properly is to find out the common denominator, and the common denominator is the behavior design, the behavioral driven design, because users are looking at, when, when they look at an application, they look for behaviors. They don't look for a technology solution. For example, when you go to Google or Amazon for that matter, or any website. When you search for something, you're looking for a behavioral side of it. You don't understand how, what, or you don't need to understand that what kind of a complex engine it is running behind, right? 
or you're looking for a behavior. So whenever you get something, any new things to be developed, always try to utilize your behavioral aspect of the application to, way, to understand if the technology solution is going to fit your need or not. And merge it with your software development methodology because you cannot have a software development methodology on one side and technical competence on the other side. They have to marry together. Again, it's a Lego pieces, right? So they all need to gel together. That's a key takeaway. All right, thank you.